коллеги, мы тогда начинаем наш... So, colleagues, I, I think we can now open our round table, which is uh, devoted to the technical uh, regulations in law. So we'll be taking a broader perspective. Uh, we'll be talking about technologies and uh, innovations. Uh, we are all uh, kind of uh, clear about uh, technical requirements. These are basically how do you operate uh, machinery, how do you operate uh, nature, but we will be talking about how technical requirements uh, would be uh, um, having an influence uh, on uh, law in general. So technical requirements would be secondary, that they have some secondary effect uh, on the legal regulation. But today, during our discussions, we want to make sure that we understand that technical requirements uh, sometimes uh, would be prevailing uh, on over the requirements that we traditionally call legal requirements. Uh, so we'll be talking about three aspects. Uh, first, the influence of the technical requirements uh, on competition. I think it is quite easy to understand that technical requirements uh, um, are available uh, in uh, different areas, uh, not only talking about some uh, technical details and the requirements, but uh, you can uh, find those in medicine and uh, other industries, and the technical requirements uh, uh, of a country may define the uh, competitiveness of uh, that economy uh, on a global market. Um, uh, just before this roundtable, we talked uh, with my colleagues about uh, some medical technical requirements, because there are some requirements in the Russian Federation to, say, uh, doctors in terms of their education and training, and uh, also in terms of the medical procedures that they uh, designate uh, and the uh, medicines uh, that they can uh, prescribe. And of course our requirements could be quite different from uh, the requirements of other countries and the requirements of other countries um, are not inferior, um, meaning that they don't care about the patients uh, in other countries. Maybe they are no, not inferior, but still we can see that uh, uh, there is some mismatch between the requirements uh, uh, between the countries and uh, sometimes uh, foreign doctors uh, might be put into an inferior position compared to the Russian doctors. Uh, of course, uh, we think uh, first of all about the safety and security of our populace uh, and uh, today we're going to discuss uh, what is the balance between the uh, public security interests uh, and uh, incentivizing competition as the locomotive of progress. Uh, the second part of our discussion would be about the influence of those technical requirements on innovations, uh, on creativity, if like. And of course, uh, you cannot probably predict uh, what uh, awaits us in future, uh, coming up with the appropriate uh, requirements, but uh, f for the technologies that are still not available. And of course, uh, uh, requirements would be catching up with the technologies. They have to catch up because uh, we need to match them uh, with the uh, level of technological uh, progress uh, at a given moment. So sometimes you have to uh, level them out. And uh, of course, we need somehow to think about how to uh, narrow this gap between the requirements and the level of technological advancement. And uh, thirdly, we would be talking about how technological uh, requirements uh, would uh, make uh, the legal regulation optimal without uh, any human interference. And I have two examples in mind. Uh, perhaps there will be more examples. Uh, but uh, for, in for instance, uh, we have uh, some uh, technical means uh, against illegal copying of uh, contents on the Internet. And of course, we're talking about uh, copyright here. So you cannot uh, violate those um, uh, copyright uh, technical means just because you cannot do so technically. Or like, uh, I don't know, uh, in a railway station, you, you need to have a barrier which would be at least uh, two meters high. So, of course, it would be a natural barrier for people trying to cross the tracks, uh, and uh, those barriers would be opening up only when a train is approaching. So, 
basically technical standards uh, would prevent uh, any human interference uh, to but also would uh, provide for the uh, legal norms uh, to uh, exist. I would like to give the floor to Lydia Tchaikovsky, who is an expert uh, in this area and uh, in the area of culture. So probably she would be dwelling upon uh, the such requirements for culture. Indeed, in culture, you might think that this is not an area where you can introduce any norms or standards. But when last year we we're thinking about modernizing our cultural legislation because of the year of culture and because of other necessities to replace the, the then existing norms. Uh, so we try to analyze what is available and uh, probably come up with the new proposals uh, and suggestions uh, that are still being discussed. And it turned out that uh, indeed we have uh, quite a lot of those standards uh, uh, may, maybe even more than in other areas. For example, there are standards of uh, cultural coverage uh, developed by UNESCO first. Uh, they are introduced uh, by the government. Uh, those are not are norms, but rather recommendations uh, for municipalities as to um, how many libraries do you do you need to have uh, per capita? How many books there should be in the libraries, and uh, how often do you renew the uh, the library, or, because you know that, uh, for, in, for instance, some books can survive hundreds of years, some can survive only a few years because of the binding and other issues. Uh, so there are standards that uh, are applicable to urban planning, because you need to understand how many schools do you need to have uh, in a new neighborhood. Uh, and um, indeed, um, it is worth going with, uh, say, theatres, because um, we're talking about some unique products. Uh, we also have uh, quite uh, a number of uh, standards and requirements uh, for uh, restoration work. Uh, we had a panel uh, uh, devoted to conservation and the restoration efforts uh, of the objects of art. Uh, for example, when they were building the Boguchanska hydropower plant, uh, when they were thinking about uh, digging a, a water reservoir there, it turned out that there were uh, quite a lot of those archaeological finds and cultural layers there. So uh, they, the, the people were saying that if you let the archaeologists go there, you won't need even excavators to dig because the, the um, archaeologists would uh, uh, dig uh, a water reservoir big enough. So uh, back then there was uh, an interesting technology invented to conserve uh, some of the objects uh, of culture and art uh, underwater. And people are saying that actually you can have a better preservation and conservation of those objects underwater compared, even compared to museums. So, so for restoration as we discussed we, we, we discussed this that uh, maybe those standards might uh, interfere with competition but uh, uh, in our work competition uh, uh, is not available because uh, take the Kiji architectural monument uh, there is no equivalent uh, for this and we need to have uh, some new technologies and new approaches uh, to restoration of such unique objects of art so there's uh, Another thing about uh, how would you decide whether it is a documentary or a full feature, and uh, the time limit there is 52 minutes. Uh, so uh, at least you can have uh, a definition uh, of uh, how to evaluate this or that uh, work of art. Uh, take the Shostakovich Memorial uh, Concerts in the Moscow Philharmonic uh, Theatre a few years back, and uh, there they presented uh, an opera devoted to the memory of Shostakovich. Uh, so it was an uh, called an opera, but it took only eight minutes to play, including breaks and, you know, trips to buffet. So, uh, I mean, apart from the artistic value, uh, you also are talking about uh, some uh, payment uh, to the artist, uh, because uh, if you would think that it was uh, just a brief musical uh, piece, uh, it was called an opera, and that is why musicians uh, were, and the authors were entitled to a full payment for a large uh, uh, performance, uh, not uh, for a very brief uh, 
performance. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, it is up to the experts in art uh, who can refer a particular piece of art uh, to this or that genre. So also, whether you can use uh, some something uh, uh, for the sake of uh, um, having a parody of uh, of that. So people are saying that basically uh, we are talking about a totally different art and you need to have a permission from the original uh, copyright holder to use a particular piece of uh, literature or art uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, making a parody of this. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, the, some technical means are probably trying to regulate themselves sometimes uh, without even uh, some human interference. Uh, in terms of uh, such a technical means of protection, I was surprised by a book that, that I bought recently in France uh, uh, where I read uh, on the cover that basically if you try to copy a page from this book uh, you would be utterly disappointed because you cannot do so. But this is a technical uh, means of uh, protecting uh, copyright. Uh, but it also means that you cannot uh, even uh, make a copy even when uh, legislation uh, permits this. For example, for the sake of academic uh, tuition or for uh, any scientific purposes. And uh, by the way, the most recent uh, changes in the civil code uh, uh, say that uh, sometimes you can use pieces of uh, art uh, for purely educational or academic or s uh, scholarly purposes even without the permission of the copyright holder. Uh, so sometimes, um, well I mean we can uh, read uh, uh, a book, a novel uh, for the purpose of entertainment, but some people would be using such novels for the uh, purposes of, uh, I don't know, writing a doctoral thesis for that. Uh, and also innovation techniques, which are uh, broadly available today in culture, for example, uh, a register of uh, movies, uh, which covers uh, um, a few important areas. Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, you probably would use it uh, to protect uh, children uh, from some indecent contents and there you would have some uh, parental guidance uh, rating for the movies and that was available in Russia since long ago, since 2003. But uh, on the other side, uh, on the other hand, uh, you uh, a permission to uh, show a movie would only be issued uh, when you provide uh, a copy for the uh, archives uh, fr uh, to, to the uh, movie archives uh, for storage or take um, ISBNs um, for books we now s see that a book is being published and we made a note that um, an ab uh, a mandatory copy of the book would be sent uh, as proper. But when we came up with this uh, draft law, we also came up with a number of other such uh, measures and uh, tools. Uh, for example, a database uh, for the objects to be imported or exported. Uh, the existing law was uh, focused on the customs code of the Russian Federation, now uh, we had to change it for the customs code of uh, the uh, European uh, Eurasian economic uh, space and before that CIS, etc. So sometimes uh, you need to have such a register, a database of the objects to uh, uh, see whether an object is being illegally moved or not. Uh, also there is a database uh, for the uh, objects uh, that have been moved during the uh, Second World War. We'll take this uh, famous uh, 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 issue of the library of Schneerson, uh, the Hubbard case, uh, and it was discussed yesterday, and the speaker actually provided a very interesting example, because this is a contentious uh, issue. How do you provide immunity to the um, works of art on loan? And sometimes you have to stop uh, such loan shows, and uh, 
uh, loan uh, performances because uh, some of the values uh, contained in the library of Schneiderson could be confiscated. Uh, but uh, we were told that uh, uh, in order to get all those immunities that the U.S. can provide, you, you have to go online and fill out a form and send it to the State Department because there is a, a register of shows and exhibitions uh, which cannot be which are immune to seizures. So we came up with the same mechanism of uh, regulating the museum uh, exhibition pool. Uh, and uh, it was uh, sort of like a preventive measure against possible abuse or crime so that uh, works of art cannot be taken out of the country by those who are not entitled to that. But also, we use this database to manage uh, the museum exhibitions and collections. Uh, um, because of the growing number of museums, uh, it is a quite a pertinent issue today. So, uh, in any case, uh, culture is an area which uh, uses standards and regulations. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor now to Alexei Abramov. When we're talking about technical regulations, we first and foremost think about uh, standards, and Alexei is head, is head of Ross Standard Agency. This agency is uh, responsible for uh, introducing standards and we are interested to hear your opinion. I am very thankful to the organizers of this uh, event uh, for the possibility to discuss the topic of interrelationship between technical and legal regulations. I think that this topic is worthy of uh, discussion by lawyers specifically because we can see that the legal, legal regulation is becoming more and more thorough and detailed and when legal acts are being developed you need to be guided by specific technical documents and regulation and if we uh, refer to those uh, theses that were mm, expressed at the beginning. I would like to express my opinion uh, with regard to those. I think that both legal and technical regulation, uh, regulation uh, is no longer just a method to conserve some state of affairs. Very often we see that uh, legal instruments and uh, technical regulations, they provide a foundation for further mm, sustainable development, especially socio-economic development. Of late in Russia, we have carried out a number of institutional reforms, and this refers to the work of our mm, agency. The reform of technical regulations started 13 ye years ago, and the legal basis was uh, targeted legislation which was uh, geared towards uh, achieving a specific result to create a transparent system of requirements to products and uh, their marketing. And in the process of this work, we uh, uh, adopted a number of legal acts, both uh, technical regulations, first at the national level, then at the level of the customs union, now at the level of the Eurasian Economic Union, and the basis for this, this compendium of, for, of legal norms are standards that support adopted technical regulations. So we can see what has happened over this period. It is incorporation of technical regulations into legal norms, thereby we fulfilled those obligations that Russia committed itself to when acceding to WTO. Of course, there are other re technical requirements that are now in force in Russia. Those are norms regulating industrial security and safety, um, environmental protection, labor protection and so on and so forth. Those uh, requirements are compulsory in Russia and they uh, ensure the fulfillment of constitutional guarantees of security and safety to people and the state. 
But we should also remember that there are other priorities. There is a, there are priorities of technological development, priorities related to enhanced competitiveness of products, priorities related to the formation of the necessary industrial basis for the development of our industries. And all uh, the world over, such goals are usually attained by introducing standards both at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level within uh, the framework of international standardization organizations. In Russia, we have about 30,000 standards in force in Russia currently. These standards by about half half of all those standards is harmonized with international standards and the voluntary nature of these documents transparent procedure for the drafting and the consensual nature of adoption create very important advantages for enterprises for interested companies to participate in this work actively and to use those standards subsequently for the purposes of ensuring uh, the protection of the interests in the field of production. Therefore, it is much easier to integrate those uh, standard standards and requirements into in uh, technological processes and business process. If we can compare the genesis of legal norms and the technical regulations, I would like to point out that when legal norms are developed, the state needs to introduce additional bureaucratic or use additional bureaucratic instruments such as public hearings, uh, anti-corruption expertise, the procedure of uh, effectiveness. There are many, many procedures without which you cannot adopt and enact a legal norm. However, standard type documents are developed in accordance with a different procedure and the Discussion of these documents within the professional, primarily engineering community, allows us to screen out those un inconvincing uh, initiatives that cannot be supported by the entire professional community. So we can see a very long process of achieving arriving at, con at a consensus on legal acts but uh, if there is no support from the top of the authority in the country I never I've never seen a legal act to be introduced in less than two or three weeks it usually takes several months at least standards usually take about a year or even 18 months to develop but they work differently they work for at least five years usually they don't require introduction uh, the introduction of of uh, amendments on an ongoing basis and usually they coincide with the technological cycle their, their life cycle is coincides with the technological cycle involved the principle of principle of voluntary participation is uh, characteristic not only for the implementation of a standard but for the drafting of appropriate documents and the owner of the technology technology who has invented something which may be used commercially he takes a decision himself how he will he is going to attain these commercial goals Will it be a standardization in order to scale up the commercial benefits or it will be protected by a patent? It is the right of the owner of a technology to decide which path to follow. Of course, standards are, is a very broad notion. They don't not only include documents that are developed within our system. These uh, documents permeate all industrial and production processes. They uh, are 
integrated with uh, corporate documents and contractual documentation and only those standards that are necessary for the entire uh, for the wide and uh, multi multi multiple time use multiple use only those standards become uh, of standards uh, of a na national and or international level i would like to point out also that standards are at the same time indicators of the level of industrial and technological development of specific countries if we take a look at the interna uh, contribution of Russia in the development in that with the national standards, we will see that our contribution uh, amounts to one-tenth of a percent, which is not something to be happy about. If we compare it with, with uh, figures for other countries, uh, half percent, we will also see uh, half percent of activity of Russian company in the patenting field. It means it, it demonstrates our attitude to um, the promotion of Russian technologies, including at international markets. We cannot say anything about any kind of expansion of Russian technologies in international markets. We see that the legislation is becoming more and more complex. In the country now we have about 5.5 thousand federal laws, if we take uh, also into account those laws that introduce amendments to other legislative uh, acts, about 10 percent of these documents regulate uh, business activities. The number of technical re re regulations is higher by an order of magnitude, and within the framework of this huge pool of documents, companies cannot uh, only uh, often find their way through. Of course, big companies can hire advisors who would help them to use these documents in their work, and they can create. IT products in order to uh, ensure the in integration of those standards into their processes and technologies. For small companies it is of course very difficult to make sense of this uh, multitude of documents that are in force. If we take the digital environment, I think that the development of this area has a lot of props, prospects in Russia. It is a very big, potentially, market in this country. In conclusion, I would like to say that in Russia we have developed a draft federal law on standardization. It has been prepared for the second reading in the parliament now, and the main, main innovation of this law is legalization of uh, using references to standards when appropriate legal norms are being adopted. De facto this practice exists and we can see in uh, the government decrees and ministerial decrees references not only to standards but all other kinds of uh, existing technical regulations. I think this is a normal practice that is used all over the world. Legal regulators should use more actively all the experience that have been accumulated and this embedded in this technical documentation. Of course, if we take the legal part of this process, the re reference to a standard doesn't make the standard a mandatory one. We discuss that a lot with the Ministry of Justice, and we have absolutely the same understanding that the reference allows you only to use those provisions of the standards within the framework of the legal regulatory field that is established by this document. The standard is for other purposes, for other uh, players it remains voluntary. I think that this m more proactive approach to using technical documentation in uh, legal regulation in uh, government procurement can be very helpful in solving many important tasks uh, 
related to the replacement of imports with local products and the introduction of new technologies and new approach to technologies. Thank you, Alexei. I would like to give the floor to Pierre Libon. Uh, um, he will say himself what he's going to talk about. The topic of standardization very often is related to intellectual property rights. There are instances where companies patent certain technical solutions and th then this solution in itself becomes a standard of sorts. And this, and this significantly strengthens the monopoly of those who have uh, title to intellectual rights. Pierre, we would like to hear your opinion how antitrust regulation is related to technical regulations. Yeah, it should be read. Um, okay. You've got the magic touch. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this beautiful city. Uh, as you know, the debate on intellectual property rights, standard setting organization, and competition law has been raging, and one could spend you know, a whole conference on it. So here I'm just going to discuss two aspects that are much more directly uh, related to the issue of innovation, which is one of the themes we're concerned with uh, in this roundtable. Now, just for the people who aren't familiar to this, if you have a standard which is set through a standard setting organization, then participants in this organization kind of declare their IP, their patents, as being standard essentials if they think that anybody who would like to practice the standard would have to essentially infringe and violate one of their patents. It is customary for the participants to have committed to licensing those patents on so-called friend terms. In practice, what does it mean? It means that there's a commitment to license. You cannot just say no. And there's a commitment to license at you know a reasonable term. Nobody knows what that is, but everybody seems happy kind of with the promise anyway. Now there have been many recent cases trying to set kind of more precise rules as to how the dispute resolution system should work if kind of the patent holder and the potential licensees or user of the standard kind of disagree. I'm not going to review that here. I'm going to review here two outstanding issues that still haven't been kind of solved either by IP law or by competition law. And the first issue is the so-called issue of the royalty base. Suppose that I contributed to a standard. The standard is, say, a communication standard that is embedded in smartphones. That certainly has a significant value. Why? Because without those standards, the phone would, could not be able to communicate with each other. Without updated standards, they should not be able to communicate large amount of data. So sending, you know, selfies to yourself, of yourself to your friends, no, no. Having a very nice camera would not be useful because if you cannot send quality picture of, of the airwave, what's the point of having a great camera and so on? So that's a standard that enables a lot of the new values in those smartphones. So it's not worth spending. It really does contribute significant value to the formal product. Now, there has been a very bitter controversy as to how the royalties, the payment for the use of the standard should be paid. And customarily, before the previous disputes, you used to just specify the payment as a percentage of the value of the final product. You would, for example, you know, I would, for example, have 5,000 standard essential pattern, and for this, I would say you can have them for 1% of the value of the iPhone. But lately, companies including Apple, actually led by Apple, have been objecting to this, saying this is not right. What you should do is that, you know, look at where your technology has been embodied. All those telecommunication technology, they have been embodied in those tiny, tiny little chips that cost $3 to produce. It should be a percentage of that, because that's where your technology is. By imposing a royalty on the whole phone, you're essentially taxing a whole bunch of things that you did not develop yourself. This is unfair. This is too high. Da da dee, da dee, da da. That's still raging, and unfortunately, with very many local competition authorities kind of disagreeing. China seems to be tempted by this kind of smallest tradable component approach that's, oh, let's just put the royalty on the little chips in which the technology has been embodied, while other 
uh, all the jurisdictions seems to be more tempted by the kind of more kind of global approach. Let's you know tax the whole fund as it was before. Why should we change now? Now, from the point of view of an economic, this is a little bit bizarre. Why? Because what is bizarre is the argument that you hear. On the Apple side, the argument is that by taxing the whole phone, you're going to try to get more money than you deserve. And of course, the argument on the other side is that by limiting it by something tiny, you're trying to pay less than what you owe to pay. Well, in economics, we trend to argue, to imagine that people are adult and that they can compute and they're not engaged in public policy exercises. And from that point of view, those arguments make no sense. Because one can certainly argue separately between how much of a payment my technology is worth to you, that's one question, and the second issue of how you, are you going to pay it. For example, let's suppose that we agree that my technology is worth one pound per iPod, right? And you're going to produce oh, 1,000 of them. You could pay this to me as one pound per iPod. That could correspond to one pound for each of the little chips that I, that I put in. Or if each iPod sells for 100 pounds, I could also tell you, OK, it's going to be 1% of the price of the whole thing. Give you exactly the same payment. So one should be able to distinguish between the amount of payment that is due and how it is imposed. So you should have little sympathy for either side when they try to mix up the, uh, to, to mix up the two issues. It's not that they don't know, but they're, of course, trying to confuse things. Try to say, okay, yes, let's agree on this little thing. What do you mean you want to, to impose a 2,000% royalty on this thing? This is outrageous. Or, oh, you know, let's agree uh, on this big thing. I'm only asking for 3%. That's nothing. These are not good arguments. So now that we've agreed that you can kind of distinguish between how much you owe me and how you're going to pay, are there any economic principles that tell you, you know, what would be kind of the right thing to do? And here, the main thing I want to do is to debunk a complete red herring, a complete falsehood, which unfortunately is quite intuitive. And the falsehood is the following. Suppose that you impose a royalty on the whole phone. It's fine, I have my phone now, but over the length of the licensing agreement, I'm going to innovate, make my phone better and better and better. And if I have to pay a royalty on the value of the phone, you're taxing this future innovation. Now, how terrible is that? Because this is actually to decrease my incentive to innovate after that. Well, I think a little bit there. What if you actually had the opposite rule and you had to pay for a chip each time you produce a phone and my royalties on the chip? Well, if you make your phone better, hopefully you're going to make more sales. I.e., you're still going to have to pay me more under this system. And actually, it's a matter of economic analysis. If you ask the following question, let's take a total amount of money that is owned to me for my technology. Let's say there's the first period when you have your phone, the second period when, if you innovate, you can make it better. And let's compare the two royalty system, one on the little bit, one on the whole thing, that over those two periods is going to give me exactly the same amount of money. Which of the two systems imposes a greater tax on innovation? Well, it's not the one that you think. It's actually the single device imposes a higher tax on innovation than the other one. So here, it's again, we have a system where, because of special interest, half of the world judicial system is kind of driven towards kind of a, a rule that does not necessarily make sense on completely false premises. Now, are there good economic reasons to choose one approach rather than the other? And yes, they are. And they're very simple. You know, in economics, we, we talk about incentive. For example, if I want you to work hard on something, either I trust you, I know you're a hard worker anyway, or if I don't, you know, if I know you're Yanis, and Yanis doesn't work hard unless you motivate him, then I have to say, I'm going to tie your pay to actually the success of the venture, right? So in that sense, if you want me to invest hard in my technology, to give you good technology and so on, you have to tie my reward to, my, to what my technology influences. So then you can have kind of two examples. The phone, where the telecommunication standards affect most of the features. If it affects most of the features, it makes sense to tie my reward to the value of the phone. On the other hand, if I had kind of an IP embedded in the chips that deal, you know, with a cigarette eater 
in a BMW, really, frankly, this does not affect much of the rest of the value of the BMW. In that case, it would make sense to have this kind of smaller, smallest component approach. Okay? Do I still have two minutes or not? Okay. There is another aspect in standard setting that has an impact on innovation, of course, and that's the absolute level of royalties that people might have to pay. And people have complained a lot about the so-called royalty stacking. And royalty stacking arises because with the complex standards that we have, we have tens of thousands of patents in the standard, and they're owned by many, many different people. So I'm going to ask for 0.1%, sounds reasonable. He's going to ask for 0.2, for 0.3. At the end of the day, I face a total royalty of 30%. So it's atrocious. So we've got to do something about it. right? So how are you going to do something about it? Clearly, at some point, somebody is going to make a decision as to what the standard of the whole, of the whole is, is worth. Either that should be the standard setting organization, or eventually it's going to be a judge in a French journal. Judgment. But still, even if you have the total fee, then there's a the question of how you're going to kind of allocate this fee between the different standard essential pattern. And you've got to realize that a standard essential pattern is just something that I say is essential for the standards. Nobody has checked that it's true. And in practice, very few of the so called standard essential patterns are both valid and actually essential. So people like Apple, again, quite reasonably say, look, when I license, you say you have 10,000 standard essential patterns. I don't want to pay for them all. I only want to pay for the one I actually infringe, I actually need. That sounds very kind of reasonable. Until then, you say, oh, then how do you compute the royalty? Well, suppose that the value of the standard is 10 million, OK? And there are kind of 10,000 patterns that would declare a standard essential pattern. That's 1,000 per pattern. Well. What Apple would tell you is that you've got to litigate and show me that those three patterns we essentially violate and they're valid. Then you're going to be, you're going to get two ten thousand of uh, the, the ten million. Well, that's not quite right, is it? Right? You cannot kind of mix oranges and apple. If you yourself say that a pattern that has been proven infringed and valid is much more solid then that is just being declared standard essential pattern, then once I've shown that my pattern is infinitely valid, it should get much more of a weight than one tenth, one ten thousand of the whole thing. So again, this is kind of an example where some of the parties, and there are faults everywhere, try to kind of have it both ways, kind of making an argument that seems reasonable, I only want to pay for the patterns that actually infringe, but then now drawing the logical consequences that if you do that, then of course a pattern that has been shown to be infringed and valid should get a much more, a much greater share of the total reward for the standard than some floating standard essential pattern that nobody knows the quality of. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Pierre. Indeed, uh, perhaps I would uh, change uh, the order of the presentations because Pierre was actually talking about IT technology. So in this slide, perhaps I would give the floor to Maria Zulic from Google. Uh, why so? Because Google, um, uh, for some time, has uh, established certain uh, technical standards uh, that, uh, to a large extent, uh, uh, were put into industrial regulation because uh, until recently we for example never had this notion of uh, an information uh, intermediary of course uh, we didn't have that because uh, uh, we needed to have some uh, issues with access to information and uh, Pierre was talking about uh, some things that uh, border on uh, some domination in IT that can uh, cause some uh, unfair competition. Some people actually also have the same criticisms of uh, Google, uh, that they prohibit something or allowing other things. So please. Thank you. In indeed, about antitrust uh, regulation, uh, I never thought about speaking today. But let me deviate a little bit uh, from the subject of technical standards and probably discuss some uh, fundamentals of uh, innovation, innovative economics. Uh, why innovative economics is made possible? What is optimal in this area? Especially since we have a number of interesting examples in our uh, 
a legislative history and practice uh, that are worthwhile to discuss. So let us not probably pay too much attention to the pictures, but maybe some of them would be uh, interesting for you. The idea of putting our economy into the innovation uh, framework uh, have been uh, pronounced long time ago, and the president actually was talking about uh, innovative economics even recently. But the Internet, as we believe, since I represent an Internet-based company, internet, the Internet, we think, uh, is uh, one of the locomotives of changes. Uh, with BCG and McKenzie, we actually came up with the uh, definition of uh, Internet economics uh, as uh, in terms of the contribution into the economy of, P of uh, the country. We think that uh, in the uh, uh, G20, uh, the Internet economy would uh, contribute at least 5% into the GDP. In this uh, era of uh, economic turbulences, uh, the Internet-based economy is continuing to grow, regardless of what is going on with the general economy. For example, the GDP growth rates in uh, 2010 was uh, minus 1.5 percent, while the Internet uh, uh, economy uh, contributed 4 percent into GDP. I want to uh, intrigue you with those numbers to explain to you that uh, there is some logical explanation for that. Uh, the Russian economy uh, today wants to pull out of the crisis. Uh, the president uh, believes that it would take at least two years. I don't think that we are going to somehow analyze uh, what this crisis is about. I think uh, German Greff yesterday in his uh, piece uh, in the Vedemisty newspaper uh, discussed quite interestingly those macroeconomic indicators. But leaving that aside, uh, let's uh, think about anti-crisis management. Uh, supporting uh, small and medium-sized uh, businesses comes uh, uh, as a second priority, and, and the innovations would uh, come as the first priority to overcome the uh, recession. Uh, by October, uh, under the President's uh, instructions, uh, the, inter the IT uh, economic fundamentals and strategy needs to be submitted. So we see the same picture as in uh, uh, Asia, where they focused on IT just to uh, overcome the 2008-2009 crisis. Uh, Without innovations, we won't make any progress, and without regulation, we won't make much progress here. What is this uh, regulation? I don't think that you are uh, so much uh, uh, involved with, the, uh, with this area, so let me just uh, try to describe briefly what is the Internet uh, for our lives. Please raise your hands uh, who, has, uh, who have at least one gadget that we have here on the picture. Just imagine yourself. Uh, uh, ten years ago, we never had even a single of these gadgets, and we never thought about the, uh, a single function from those gadgets that uh, they can perform now. Ten years ago, we never had uh, YouTube, uh, we never had Skype, uh, we never had uh, broadband uh, Wi-Fi. And we never had such progressive things uh, like um, this uh, little... Uh, internet mem, which I tried to kind of like use it, uh, an SMN sent uh, by voice uh, from watches, unimaginable. This uh, was only shown in some uh, sci-fi movies, uh, but now we have all those smartphones, gadgets, uh, uh, things that uh, we only thought as uh, purely sci-fi uh, sci uh, 15 years ago. But this is happening right now, uh, where, and there's a lot of work behind this. Uh, but this is the top layer, the surface of the innovative uh, 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 economy that we're talking uh, about uh, uh, today. So thanks to the Internet, the picture changed drastically. A few numbers. So for example, 46% of the uh, Earth's uh, population would prefer Internet access to having a personal passenger car. Imagine, this is just a recent analysis, uh, same about the mobile access to the Internet. Over 70% of Russians uh, are prepared to kind of like forget about coffee and chocolate uh, in favor of uh, such uh, uh, Internet access.
After 2012, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, more mobile phone owners uh, than the owners of toothbrushes. Well, I mean, you can make all kinds of conclusions uh, uh, from that, but it tells you about the spread of the Internet and its uh, capabilities. Uh, the number of Internet users is about uh, 2.5 to 3 billion people. Uh, in Russia, the IT market has been uh, booming for several years now. And according to the Russian Association of Electronic Media, the Internet trade is over 1 trillion rubles worth, about 1.6% uh, of uh, GDP. And uh, the economy of all Internet-dependent uh, sectors, as Mr. Putin uh, put it in March of this year, is uh, over 67 trillion rubles, that is over 10% uh, of GDP. Now, the movers uh, for IT would be three businesses, uh, three types of businesses, uh, uh, small businesses, uh, creators, uh, and uh, IT companies. Uh, companies that are using the uh, possibilities of today's internet are by 26% uh, more profitable and grow by 50% higher than uh, those companies that uh, don't go online. In terms of uh, the Internet uh, capacity, we think about uh, cloud technologies, uh, free or very cheap for your business, uh, for your communications, uh, free social media marketing tools uh, like uh, share, repost and retweet. I think uh, w people know about all those uh, terms. Uh, mobile navigation. Uh, online advertising, uh, e-trade, and etc., etc. You probably know about uh, those logos, but you probably never thought that Google, eBay, and Skype, and Amazon, or YouTube, uh, they were all originally classical uh, startups uh, with uh, just two people uh, in all two brains used with one PC, and they started to first uh, f they started their f first business in, in a garage uh, more or less and uh, uh, started small now this logic uh, moves uh, the innovative e uh, economy forward uh, thanks to the trans uh, border transboundary nature of the internet and uh, even despite uh, some technological barriers in this uh, area now, take open data. This is something uh, which is largely discussed in Russia. Some people are trying to implement this idea of uh, open data. Uh, and this is basically uh, uh, data which goes into public domain. And uh, uh, disclosing such data gives a real benefit to the economy. Take the uh, healthcare in the United States. Uh, they actually freed up uh, $300 billion uh, thanks to outsourcing, uh, thanks to mobile applications used. Uh, the growth of the European Union economy uh, is uh, from uh, 150 to 180 billion euros every year thanks to mobility and thanks to the new applications and functions. So much can be said uh, here what, how the internet economy today. What is the internet economy today? About content, so we actually uh, mentioned briefly uh, the copyright here. Now, in terms of uh, content uh, creation, uh, this is something uh, which the internet is based upon. Uh, and the internet not only facilitates access to professional data, but the internet is a community of users uh, who are the creators of new content, uh, of new uh, market niches, of new formats. Uh, and there are a few examples of some success of, uh, successful, uh, many of those, of, of course, but I only am providing you with two such examples. So examples of uh, successful uh, use of uh, such uh, uh, new formats. Uh, Lindsay Sterling, which was refused by all the uh, sh uh, talent shows, uh, and she went uh, to YouTube. She used the free uh, capability of YouTube and uh, started uploading her violin concerts uh, onto YouTube. And thanks to a huge number of users uh, of the YouTube and popularity of her performances, she became uh, 
a very rich person and a very famous person and quite quickly and there are actually many such examples uh, but let me uh, come to discuss uh, regulation and naturally when we're talking about the copyright on the internet uh, we're talking not only about making money but also about how to protect uh, the content and I should say that most of the internet users uh, they are not looking for some pirated uh, content we did quite a lot of uh, analysis of this because because using uh, the Google Trend uh, platform uh, you actually can uh, see the uh, search uh, results and uh, in different areas and we actually wanted to, uh, to see how many people were looking for a particular piece uh, by uh, Donald Trott uh, which was the most selling book in uh, 2013 so when we are trying to compare the uh, uh, searches uh, for that book and uh, uh, searches for downloading that book for free we see that downloading for free actually has uh, less fewer hits uh, than uh, the just looking for a book where to buy it uh, same true is with the game of thrones uh, uh, shows so now uh, we only 2%, I am uh, responsible for 73% of uh, such pirated content to be placed on the internet. So we're talking about some professional pirates uh, uh, on the internet, um, and uh, those are being opposed by legislation, but most of the users are prepared to um, use uh, legal content uh, within the framework and cap capabilities that are offered by the internet another interesting number if you compare the whole traffic of the three search um, uh, uh, engine google yahoo and bing uh, then uh, the um, uh, transfers uh, to such pirated uh, 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 websites as uh, pirate um, uh, pirate bay uh, would be quite a fraction of a percentage of uh, such uh, transfer. So basically we, are, we can uh, really overcome this uh, uh, piracy trend. So now I think that uh, my colleagues uh, already know this information. Indeed Google, in terms of uh, protecting copyright uh, on the Internet, uh, focuses and uses uh, the US digital copyright law of the United States in Russia we uh, call the system a self uh, regulation system because uh, this uh, the uh, the Russian legis legislation would not stimulate the use of such uh, advanced technologies to be used to protect um, but what is the difference uh, um, First, our technologies and solutions, including uh, on the U YouTube, uh, are constantly evolving, and we invested over $30 million uh, into a system which is uh, called Content ID. We constantly monitor the statistics of pirate-like resources, and we receive about 4 million uh, applications a week to remove some pirate uh, content. But this is still less than 1% of our all information that we index. So, the net, when we uh, respond to the application for a removal of content within six hours, internet platforms therefore can themselves offer ways of protecting copyright and uh, stimulate the creation of uh, creative content. Not long ago, uh, in Russia, the legislation was on the protection on intellectual rights has been expanded. We are, share the concern of our colleagues that it may uh, lead to some infringement on the interests of uh, other people. But I think uh, I think that self-regulation will play an important role here, which is much easier than to go to the court of law. And there may be problems for innovative businesses in this country. We are talking about uh, the storage and processing of data. This sphere, storage, exchange and processing of data, plays a central role in the functioning of any modern technological company or even an internet dependent company. The contribution of the service sector here is up to 30 percent. The growth of costs um, for uh, data processing leads to 3% uh, 
growth and the cost of the final product and of course fi the final price for the end user will be higher for all users and the possibility of outsourcing of many business processes is a source of effectiveness for a majority the majority of the overwhelming majority of SMEs geographic uh, distribution of businesses which became possible thanks to the use of uh, cloud technologies and this is one of the factors for the successful development of the economy and the law that requires the storage of personal data of Russian citizens on the territory of the country may impact the situation. Many countries try to protect the personal data of their citizens, but no, but no, not a single country trans transitioned to complete localization of personal data. In Brazil, they tried to do that, but then they saw that it will lead to a negative economic effect for the national economy as a whole. In Brazil, these research were undertaken uh, using data from Korea, data in some other countries, and they also reconsidered uh, their approaches in Brazil. This initiative was rejected because potentially the, mm, the losses uh, of localization from localization were estimated at 1% of the GDP and 4% loss of all the incoming investments. In Russia, we have some data, although official data haven't yet published. It was ordered by a number of Russian associations, American Chamber of Commerce, American Russian Business Union, Rotec, and it was carried out of the by European Bureau of International Economic Policy. The data were collected on Russia, and they also predict that the economy will lose, well, the real decrease in the GDP, thanks to localization of personal data, may, uh, turn, may be up to 4%. That's the European resource researchers tell us. So, uh, using these two examples, and uh, on the whole, we can say that there are even more examples than these. So, these two examples of regulating copyright and uh, personal data, so if this uh, regulation is uh, uh, rigid, it may significantly damage the innovative businesses. But if this regulation will be soft, both uh, internet users and intermediaries and the state will receive additional benefits. So we need to find a compromise that would combine both legal and uh, business-related tasks. I would like now to give the floor to Sergei Matveev, who represents the Ministry of Education. The topic of personal data is a separate issue. There was a separate roundtable devoted to it here. Marina spoke a lot about uh, open data, about informatization, how it changes our world, and the Ministry of Education does a lot to change something in this area and to take on board these technologies. Sergei, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Igor. Dear colleagues, I would like to go back to the title of our uh, round table, normative technical regulations. We have talked a lot about technological developments, about standards as such, and I would like to come back to history and say that technical regulation has another important meeting. It is a combination of legal norms and technologies. And here I would like to ask a very simple question. How can, can law exist without technologies? Can technologies exist without law in the modern world? world? What Medinsky uh, said today about anti-pirate legislation, well, all of this is related that the level of the technological development is ahead of the level of legal culture. We have a technology, but we don't have le legal regulation of a technology, and we're trying to uh, bridge those gaps in a patchwork manner, adopting laws without understanding their long-term consequences. Technologies, they not always 
ahead of uh, are ahead of law. Sometimes law is ahead of technologies, and I will give an example later on. It turns out that these two concepts are uh, inseparable. The new management theory tells us that all competencies, all uh, models of society developments are always in two planes, uh, in the technical field and the human uh, field. Um, there are soft and hard skills, and they are combined. Uh, here, today, in the integration of technological systems and changes in the legislation is a very interesting process. Legislation governs the relations in the society, and technology is a means to uh, implement those relations and by developing internet systems, YouTube, we need to simultaneously develop our legislation, but we need to uh, think about the technology of its implementation at the same time, and maybe it will be an information technology, a love example of the gap between technology and legislation. Intellectual property that is mentioned uh, by each and every one at this round table and other round tables. The uh, appearance of the fourth part of the civil code of the Russian Federation uh, um, led to uh, the situation uh, that the legislation on intellectual property in the Russian Federation is more or less in line with the international experience. We uh, now are in compliance with all the international principles. What do we have inside the Russian Federation? The level of culture of the society doesn't allow us to introduce this legislation. How many licensing agreements? We have 3,100 a year. And do we need the fourth part of the civil uh, code, which regulates only 3,000 of uh, licensing? So. In the field of exchange of ideas, we are far from the real marketplace because the society remains within the old Soviet model of com commercialization. So the government says, uh, let businesses uh, take uh, various uh, new technologies for commercialization. The businesses say in the reverse, and everybody waits for the government to become an intermediary. We cannot implement uh, the wishes of both sides without technical systems. Having come, having across this uh, problem, uh, we cannot develop the intellectual property rights market and uh, the fourth s part of the civil code. And uh, the Ministry of Education and Science start began to develop information systems for each and every legislative proposal and so uh, we uh, introduced the pre-patent stage we understand that patent either exists or not and we introduced something mythical if you have carried out some R&D work you have to uh, register it in the information system, you should uh, enter all the data using the forms provided by the government, identifying results that may lead to patenting in the longer run, and the creation of an information system, and not by uh, the act of government. We created this pre-patent stage, a myth, and the level of information culture penetration in the society is quite high in Russia. People know how to push buttons, and our scientists f followed this trajectory in one year. We increased uh, the, uh, the results of um, intellectual work and R&D work by twofold. Uh, so non-patent forms of um, intellectual property, computer programs grew by a factor of 2.5 or 3. So by introducing technological changes into the system, we started to form new culture, in a way. Of course, we should identify those objects when they are ready to be sold, but the society is not used to that. The science doesn't sell, businesses do not buy. Until we have established these uh, relations, monetary and 
exchange of goods for money. And now we uh, created uh, serious incentives. All our scientific institutions depend on the federal budget. Then we can force them uh, to identify those results of intellectual activities and register those results, um, threatening them that they may lose the budget allocations if you don't comply. So important things are uh, the number of registered results of intellectual activity and the uh, inst number of instances of their use. And uh, we create com some sort of a competition in such intermediary indicators. Through the information system that was made by the government unified and all the government entities that receive money for uh, the purposes of scientific research, it allowed us to more or less increase the level of legal culture. Using this trick, we attained one other benefit. The information system is a technology that incorporates legislation in the minds of our people. It means creation of a legal culture. Federal Law 35, changes to the Civil Code, created a new entity, a new concept, open license. No matter where you go, scientific institute or something dealing with humanitarian knowledge. So we have created a good progressive mechanism. People don't know what it is all about. What is an open license? What does the ministry do? The ministry is preparing to change the information system, and when you place in the system a dissertation or a scientific report, you can see an option there, open license, and a comment. To transfer my result to an unidentified number of persons on appropriate conditions, you can identify those conditions. So people are not going to use the fourth, uh, to, 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 to open the fourth part of the civil code in order to understand what the fourth, what the open license means. By going through a procedure that the government obliged people to use, people, those who do R&D for budget money, and everybody will then understand what an open license means. We are using technical regulations, we are using technical systems to incorporate legislation to incorporate this culture, to create the necessary understanding of these norms, a certain number of uh, terms and definitions in order to create all the steps in this ladder. The market for intellectual property is the highest point. We cannot jump there from the place where we are. So we are moving from one step to another, trying to create this green wave, like traffic lights on a highway. We register results in a pre-patent stage. We improve the patenting mechanisms in 2016. Intellectual assets will be excluded from the taxable basis base. And by creating information and technological instruments, I, we are sure that in two and three years we are going to develop all this and achieve that result that President of the Russian Federation spoke about. But probably the most interesting result of this work for me, of this positive movement, is that as of now, to consider changes to legislation without creating a technological instrument for its implementation doesn't make sense. As it is does make sense to create technological instruments without legislative support. It changes the entire uh, models of um, case law and precedent law. I think that we can create a compromise trajectory when we will be treating the development of um, information instruments and uh, communication instruments and legislative instruments at the same time, because then uh, simultaneously we will form legal culture, we will create uh, technologies that um, help to avoid uh, infringements, we will develop certain model of self-regulation when the law is 
goes together with the technology, we get a totally new opportunity for the development of the society. I mentioned information and communication technologies, but we will have probably the same situation in biotechnologies and genetic engineering when the technology sh shall be treated together with the changes, with legislative changes. That's the, all I wanted to say. Thank you, Sergei. We have started talking a lot about IT, and I would like to give the floor to Andrei Kolosovsky, who is from Microsoft Russia. So thank you, Marina, for speaking before me, because it is better that one cannot better than her to promote in the Internet and uh, IT technologies. I will uh, talk about technical regulations instead. Many technological breakthroughs and in business models that can turn those technologies into a mass product, they were developed where regulation didn't exist or where it was possible to go around this regulation. The Internet is a very vivid example of that and the internet industries in Russia is well basically the same it, it was developing quite successfully when it was not regulated very heavily there are other examples there was very strong regulation of uh, access to frequencies for radio and TV broadcasting when internet uh, broadcasting appeared so this uh, all frequency limitations were bypassed other problems emerged with the protection of intellectual property and content and, and uh, copyright there are other examples when new technologies uh, come across old ways of regulations the idea of amazon uh, to send uh, parcels on drones they have drones but uh, there are no, there's no lab business, there is no legal regulations that would prescribe how those drones may be used in practical terms. It doesn't mean, mean that we should abolish all regulation. It is necessary to ensure safety and security of users and consumers. But if we approach this from a general standpoint, we think that uh, technical regulation should not be based on uh, a process of how a product is being made, but uh, not on the technology itself, uh, but on the final result for the end user. And uh, mean something, uh, and whether to restrict something in terms of uh, the consumer functions or not. Um, otherwise, you, you won't really be able to catch up with the innovations uh, in your regulation and because you cannot really foresee any uh, new consumer functions in the future. Uh, another important feature of um, uh, such uh, innovation incentives is that uh, basically you need to have a very clear and simple uh, definition not only for lawyers but for the engineers and uh, inventors so that they would understand uh, what can be done and what should not be done because of the uh, uh, say regulations or security uh, regulations uh, so you need to somehow describe uh, because uh, sometimes it is quite difficult to describe what uh, should be done in terms uh, in light of the technological uh, advancement now, speaking about the digital technologies, uh, what Marina also touched upon, uh, and I would like to say a few words, uh, is that uh, indeed we need to have uh, some norms uh, at different uh, uh, levels. It could be at a governmental, at a national level, it could be at a private level, and uh, or could be basically uh, at... Uh, a combined level uh, involving the contributions from international organizations and of course this can be done through the technological uh, norms and um, the development of industries uh, otherwise it would be quite difficult to really develop a transborder transboundary economy but I'd say if you touch upon such a conservative areas uh, 
finances and financial services now you of course you have uh, more complexities but still you uh, do see some uh, uh, standards being uh, developed like um, gap or uh, the european union standards uh, now an important parameter uh, of uh, technical regulation and requirements uh, would be of course uh, security uh, standards and measures and here of course we also need to somehow uh, think about uh, certain uh, universal nature of such uh, requirements because uh, various uh, national uh, regulations for and certifications uh, result in the fact that uh, it is uh, difficult or impossible uh, to comply with such uh, norms and regulations uh, across the borders uh, or at least uh, to comply with some of those um, requirements would be made quite difficult there are some attempts uh, and quite uh, widespread uh, to provide for uh, security through localization uh, and through local storage of data now Perhaps there is some logic in uh, local uh, storage of data to provide access or to limit access uh, uh, to data on the part of, say, uh, public authorities. But uh, the logic of um, providing for the security and consumer security including uh, could be uh, very hard to justify because um, you are talking about some uniform architecture and the vulnerabilities and the risks uh, in such uh, a local architecture would be multiplying plus of course uh, if you're talking about some uh, personal data and uh, business data you're talking about some uh, uh, trust and confidence of those consumers and uh, corporations uh, to ensure the security of data and last point, um, going back to to the uh, initial idea of uh, talking about the uh, balance of interests, uh, I think that this regulation uh, of the balance of interests between individual consumers who are interested in uh, technological innovations and the uh, some uh, public consent about uh, societal good and public good uh, is there, but uh, at the same time you you are probably prone uh, to uh, securing old technologies for the sake of uh, jobs and sometimes you opt for new technologies and then you also need to think about the interests of a state uh, which would uh, not necessarily uh, uh, match uh, the public good interests uh, they because the state would have some other functions to perform uh, and they also need to monitor the risks uh, that um, are visible or that are perceived by the state uh, in its uh, peculiar way. I mean, uh, we discussed this uh, during the Megaphone uh, panel and in other sections, but uh, even here you need to find a proper balance, a feasible balance, uh, so that uh, access to some data would be provided, but without undermining the uh, uh, consumer rights and the technological uh, capacities and capabilities that are being offered uh, in the formats of services. Um, Yesterday we discussed this uh, mostly with a focus on uh, Russian realities, but this is not a unique problem for Russia. For example, uh, there was a recent letter from uh, the major uh, American marketplace uh, to President Obama not to introduce uh, uh, any uh, regulations that uh, would uh, make uh, those uh, corporations to have some uh, trapdoors uh, and backdoors uh, into uh, the software so that such backdoors can be used by law enforcement because uh, those uh, uh, corporations claim that basically it can be abused by hackers and uh, we are also talking about consumer rights and um, uh, the interests of consumers so that should come first and I hope that we would find such a balance between the various interests uh, thank you Andrei because since we are quite limited in time uh, uh, I would uh, probably ask question to Yanis and uh, indeed uh, there, there was this uh, question about harmonization uh, raised by Andrei harmonization of uh, technical requirements and norms and I wonder what is your view on the following uh, harmonization is it good
Is it something that really provides for equal uh, competition uh, and uh, is good uh, for society and communities? Uh, or, on the other hand, when we're talking about harmonization, we're talking about some uh, uh, average uh, standards applicable to universally to all the countries, but uh, those average uh, standards, they would be reflecting the interests of a group of states, of countries. Uh, just because uh, uh, such uh, standards originated from those countries and then other countries joined in. So those joining in countries may uh, have other interests than, uh, that are not uh, compatible with those average uh, standards. Uh, so uh, the question is whether, what is your view? on uh, harmonization. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing or it depends uh, on uh, particular circumstances? Uh, probably sometimes it is good uh, when we have different legislations in different countries. Thank you very much, uh, Igor. A very interesting uh, question that you raise, and I will uh, reply to that throughout my presentation. Just to say that um, the issue um, is the issues are actually, I think, uh, not very different in the context of private governance uh, regimes, standard setting organizations. Some parties, the most powerful ones, are obviously setting the standards, the others are following, and I think the same happens also uh, in the intergovernmental uh, level. Uh, but before uh, replying on that, I would just like to say a few words a little bit taking a broader perspective um, on uh, the interaction between technology, technological standards uh, and regulation. Uh, I mean, we live in a very diverse uh, and I think uh, really rapidly evolving uh, technological environment uh, where uh, we have sometimes the impression that uh, law is actually trying to cope uh, with uh, developments uh, in technology. Uh, and, but in a certain way, this is something that has always uh, happened. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, there has always been the development of, you know, even agricultural technologies in the, um, that enabled us uh, to uh, become farmers, uh, in a way, in, in, uh, in, 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 in very old times. Uh, that obviously led to the possibility of uh, commodification. Uh, of the land and obviously monetization after of the work and the products of of that particular land uh, and issues of appropriability, let's say of the revenues uh, where obviously the law has come in in order to uh, to regulate that through the uh, allocation of property rights uh, but also of other mechanisms in order to deal with this type of appropriation and I will say the the debates that we recently have, you know, Pierre actually uh, was discussing about the iPhone. Sometimes, you know, the structure of those debates is not very different from uh, what uh, older technologies actually had uh, created. Uh, and as uh, a process, let's say, of commodification and monetization, appropriation disputes, and then the legal system intervening in order to uh, to regulate that. So from the point of view of the legal system, we have different, very different uh, possibilities. Uh, one is to have a system of uh, private governance uh, to deal with this type of disputes. And I will say the classic example of that is uh, contract law. Uh, I will call it a diadic contract law in the sense that uh, in the classic configuration, you are dealing basically with a contract, a transaction between one party and the other. Uh, and the principle of that being obviously uh, the freedom of contract and the quality let's say, between uh, the parties in terms of bargaining power so that both of them can achieve the most efficient solution. However, we know that this is um, obviously not always the case. These assumptions actually do not always work in a practical context. And in, in particular, if you look to the modern technological environment of networking and uh, standard contracts, uh, this is certainly something that, um, uh, that this paradigm actually cannot work. Um, for instance, if you think about our, you know, like say, as users, when we are joining Facebook uh, and we are part, let's say, of a particular contract of the social uh, network, uh, that obviously, uh, you know, leads to a number of externalities. Uh, for others, but also uh, with regards to us, you know, that somehow puts us into the 
governance system of Facebook, which, as we know, changes uh, also quite um, often their privacy norms and the norms actually that regulate uh, this particular network they have created. And in that sense, this is where uh, the legal system intervenes by own contract law uh, through, for instance, consumer protection uh, um, legislation, privacy or data protection legislation in order, let's say, to uh, protect the interests of the users uh, in that context. So that brings me to the second, let's say, uh, method of dealing with uh, issues, uh, which is public governance system, so not the private governance system. And of course, um, in that context, we might think of the classic uh, regulatory model, which uh, you know developed uh, differently in Europe and the United States. In Europe, actually, in the 19th century, that was based on uh, ministerial departments uh, somehow announcing norms and technical standards in certain cases. Uh, uh, actually which have been um, uh, held by ministers uh, but also in the United States, we have a different model of uh, having a, you know, the uh, delegation to independent uh, regulatory agencies uh, that emerge. Uh, and in particular, you know, if you think a little bit about the major uh, innovations in the 19th century railway, we had you know, the first, let's say, independent regulatory agency in the United States uh, was actually the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1886. That was actually about to regulate uh, railways. Telecoms, we have the Federal Trade Communication, energy, etc. So we have actually the development of a specific sector, specific regulators uh, with some form of, or at least we hope, specialized knowledge of the field, which will obviously, you know, somehow create these rules and uh, subject industry uh, to some form of accountability. Now, of course, in that context, we have what uh, the issue that you raised before, in the sense that we have obviously uh, different uh, models of uh, public governance that have developed across the globe, uh, and in a globalized uh, world uh, where obviously uh, uh, firms are um, somehow launching products at the global uh, level, uh, well, they have to take into account these different standards, uh, which are actually national. Uh, and then, of course, uh, through the globalization, we have seen the interest of developing cooperation uh, in order to uh, um, develop models that could apply by own the nation state. Uh, and obviously, in the context of the EU, it's a classic example of you know, having an international uh, body, international organization, or sui generis international organization, I will call it, uh, that uh, has actually taken the role of uh, harmonizing technical regulations across member states. Um, uh, but of course, uh, now we have uh, most recently the uh, issues raised by the uh, transatlantic uh, uh, relationship between the United States and Europe, but also between the United States and Trans-Pacific uh, with, uh, with Asia, and also, uh, you know, the in increasing importance uh, right now because there's actually uh, the negotiation between Japan and, and the European Union as well uh, in that context of regulatory cooperation. Uh, so what is the objective of these uh, regulatory cooperation, regulatory convergence era? Uh, is actually to um, implement some form of regulatory compatibility or convergence. I will not call this harmonization in a way the word um, has been, uh, I would say, quite uh, significant in the European Union context uh, in the 1970s. I would say until the mid-80s where we realized that it was impossible to harmonize standards in detail across different sectors and there we had to develop a new method of harmonization that was put forward by the single European Act in 1985-86. Uh, so from then on we moved and obviously we cannot you know, uh, consider harmonization at the global scale or even between e Europe and the US. Uh, so that's why we use the term regulatory convergence uh, in a way to show that what we want is not to develop sp like the same outcome uh, in the sense of an harmonized rule that will apply to uh, both, but to develop pro some convergence of processes uh, and some uh, information between partners in order to avoid conflicts that are unnecessary, uh, that uh, do not really reflect a real differences in terms of values. Uh, 
So if you look to the uh, transatlantic investment and um, trade investment partnership that is currently negotiated between Europe and the US, and I rely on uh, the information that is available publicly through the website of the European Commission that dates from the 5th of January 2015. Obviously, many things have happened since. Um, there is a regulatory cooperation uh, chapter which uh, uh, it tries to uh, put forward uh, more, uh, let's say, um, uh, convergence in the context of the process, uh, the fact that a regulation should be transparent, uh, that stakeholders uh, should be involved early on, and stakeholders from uh, both parties the European Union and the United States when they are actually attempting to regulate. Uh, notification requirements and information requirements uh, with regards to the regulatory plan of each member of each of the, uh, of the two partners, uh, as well as, um, quite interestingly, if, um, provisions concerning the fact that we need to develop common evidence-based uh, type of uh, norms in the sense that we are relying on in, uh, impact assessments or cost-benefit analysis. We try to cooperate with regards to the methodologies that we use when we assess data or the economic uh, analysis that we actually perform. Uh, and all that is supposed to enhance uh, convergence uh, across the United States and Europe. We also have, quite interestingly, the creation of a regulatory cooperation council between the EU and, EU and the US, uh, which were actually all the these um, uh, topics, uh, regulatory convergence and cooperation, will be discussed. Uh, these are procedures that are not subject to the dispute settlement part of the agreement. Uh, it's actually going to be a political, let's say, uh, body, but I think it's quite significant to see that. Uh, we have obviously, uh, uh, I mean, theoretically one might think that we can develop even common uh, regulatory agencies in the way, uh, for instance, that uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand developed uh, in the, in the way with regards to the food sector uh, or the pharmaceutical uh, sector. So um, it is something that theoretically it is a possibility, of course, but obviously that's not uh, there yet. So that's, let's say, is the, the second uh, aspect, the second governance, let's say public governance and how actually things work there. Uh, we have seen most recently also the development of a kind of an hybrid uh, governance system, public-private governance uh, system. And uh, that is actually uh, something that I will refer to in the context of uh, the special standardization institute or standard setting organizations uh, that actually we have. Now, why we have all these standard setting organizations, basic organizations of producers and uh, um, in one industry, in the different industries, is because um, we, we think that they are more able to incorporate the main expertise in the field and follow up, let's say, the rapid change in technology, uh, which obviously uh, we think that uh, uh, you know, public uh, bodies or regulators are not able by themselves to uh, be as well informed. Uh, and in a way, you know, the, the claim behind is that it's like there's a larger, let's say, technical ground superiority of these standard setting organizations in order to achieve this particular relevant uh, task. So these technical standard setting uh, through standard organizations has been in the vanguard of the development of inclusive procedures for enhancing the quality and legitimacy of uh, standards. And uh, of course, we can give the example of the uh, International Organization for Standardization, which has an architecture of over 200 technical committees that are devoted to the making a revision of ISO standards in the various areas in which uh, this uh, organization has taken a role. The ISO is a membership organization which comprises representatives of the National Standardization Institutes, which also provide most of its financing, uh, the balance actually coming from stay sales of standards. In organizing its standard setting functions, the ISO uh, treats a path between efficient process on one hand and demands for openness, representation, and inclusion among the various communities affected by the standards on the other. The process of setting uh, a new standard is initiated by a vote of a technical committee, and the task of drawing up a draft standard is assigned to a working group of the committee. Uh, that actually working group generally functions through uh, consensus and uh, typically works quite slowly. A subject a draft then is subject to uh, revision initially by the uh, full technical committee and subsequently by the members of the ISO, where it is again subject to comment and revision twice. Uh, 
and participants in this uh, processes comprise users of standards, uh, typically employees of large firms, uh, members of national standard organizations and other experts, including those from universities and consultancy firms. Uh, consumers, let's say, are much less involved in that particular process, and one might think that uh, this obviously uh, might raise some type of uh, concerns. Now, um, of course, uh, the problem with the, uh, let's say, uh, composition of these standard setting organizations is that it's highly characterized by a degree of participation, high degree of participation from members of the relevant industry. And obviously, uh, that is something that might bias a little bit the process. And uh, in a way, as I said before, it is also important to include uh, other um, stakeholders uh, and protected groups such as consumers uh, in this particular process. The fact that consumers are not included in the process, I think, might give rise to uh, a legitimate intervention through uh, competition authority actions probably later on in order to represent the consumer's interests that were unrepresented in the process. So in a way, I would think that uh, one might avoid having a uh, intrusion of competition at the later stage if you know one takes obviously care of including uh, uh, and participation of consumers uh, in the context of uh, forming uh, the standards at the first uh, place now of course uh, standard organization is not the only way through private governance of standards might be set I mean that supposes that it's a competitive area it's a competitive sector where you have different standards and different companies that control different standards and they won't actually develop uh, a common standard for the industry but one might think also of cases of uh, de facto, let's say, uh, standardization through uh, the domination of an industry by one company. Uh, one might think, for instance, uh, of AT&T prior to the 1982 uh, breakup in the United States, which was actually a monolithic controller of the network, and in a certain way, I mean, there was no need for specific standards. I mean, the standards were set by AT&T. One might think the same, for instance, with regards to uh, Microsoft uh, in the context, at least that was one of the arguments that was referred to in the European uh, Court of Justice, in the Court of First Instance case, uh, concerning the fact that you know we have some sort of de facto standardization uh, through the importance of Microsoft uh, with regards to the operating uh, system. Uh, so, in a way, you know, in this case, you have a different model. Uh, of, of standardization through de facto standardization. Uh, now, the problem actually one could uh, have with these is obviously that, of course, you know, you might be a bias in the, in the development of your standard uh, rules, and in particular, uh, if you think about, uh, even in the context of a standard setting organization, uh, one might think of possibilities of uh, firms, let's say, trying to avoid new technologies uh, being included in the standard. I mean, there's a very classic case in US, Anderson's Law, the Allied Tube case, uh, which which involved a national standard for electric uh, conduit, which was promulgated by an organization concerned with establishing uniform standards for building products. Although the electric conduit and most of other building products are not networked in any strong sense, standard setting uh, is uh, nevertheless important because obviously it's very costly for develop uh, in a, at any municipality across, let's say, uh, the country, uh, individual standards for safety and functionality. Uh, and obviously, secondly, uh, the manufacturing distribution of building products are sold in nationwide markets, and it would be very costly if manufacturers had to comply with diverse and often mutually exclusive standards in different areas. Now, in the Alive 2 case, actually, the plaintiff here uh, had developed a, a plastic PVC uh, conduit uh, that was allegedly uh, superior from the steel conduit that was uh, more or less uh, uh, the norm within this particular standard setting organization because obviously it was less costly and uh, obviously easier to work with and non-conductive of course uh, and the uh, defendant allied tubes and others develop a scheme in order to somehow uh, pack uh, the standard setting organization and obtain a disapproval of this plastic conduit with the result that it was for the time prohibited uh, uh, to be used uh, by uh, local building codes. So that actually shows an example where incumbent companies that are you know, quite powerful, they have developed the technology, might uh, take hold of the standard setting process and 
exclude, let's say, from uh, the um, standards uh, a quite interesting and new uh, invention uh, which is presented by another company. So which obviously raises the issue of the representation that we need to have uh, in this standard synchronization of different uh, groups and stakeholders and the need to probably think about reforming uh, the context of their work to a certain degree. Thank you. Yanis, everybody has already spoken from those speakers who were on the list. Are there any questions from the floor to the speakers? Okay, thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you for uh, showing interest in our roundtable discussion today.